Here we go. Okay. Um, again, I am Dr. Kim Godwin. I'm an instructional designer at MTSU Online. Um, with me today are Karen Hine and Tara Perrin, also instructional designers with MTSU Online. Uh, and this is one of our presentations that uh, we are putting together to help you all as faculty um, with some of the resources and struggles. Um, we all have some things that cause us extra anxiety and stress in life. Um, and one that we've heard over the last mm, about two years and two weeks since like a global pandemic hit um, that we're just kind of overwhelmed and there's a lot of overload and we don't really know um, how to address that both for our own selves as faculty and then as well as for our students that are experiencing that same overload. So um, this presentation today is just gonna talk a little bit about what is cognitive overload and how do we address it um, specifically in online classes, but it also does flow over into face-to-face, -face, hybrid, blended, flipped, uh, high flex, if you happen to know and do high flex, um, any of those, it, it kind of carries over in everything because it's the same universal. Um, and it also carries over to probably your life outside of the institution. So um, in an effort to also utilize new technologies and create additional overload for you, uh, my presentation today is with H5P. We are trying to model the way with that because we think it's a pretty cool resource. Um, so I'm going to show you a presentation in H5P today. And I think Tara has another H5P presentation coming up soon. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, as always, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat because um, Tara and Karen are awesome at making sure that those get answered. Um, and then that will also help me know if I missed something and you have questions, please feel free to put those there or you can interrupt me. I'm okay with that too. All right, so here we go. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Okay. Um, okay, so our presentation today, uh, no joke, cognitive overload is real in online courses. And I embraced that it was really an overview and we weren't going to go too far into it when I was putting it together. Um, so um, we really are looking at what is cognitive overload um, and how it impacts us in our learning as well as our students learning. So the topics that we're gonna talk about today a little bit are cognitive load theory, the knowledge void instruction hours, load estimators, and some tips from MTSU online, some things that you might be able to kind of take with you um, as you are moving forward, things that are, are things that we run into, things that we suggest, uh, ways that might just kind of help you and help your students. Um, and if the font's too small, y'all just let me know. Um, so our objectives today are to be aware of cognitive load theory, um, and that should say, and its impact. Um, so I'm just owning my college issues today and spelling and use of words, um, and its impact on faculty and students. Um, commit to analyzing instruction hours and courses and consider utilizing load estimators. Take responsibility for my own knowledge void and consider load in content decisions and assessment types. Okay, so cognitive load theory. Um, I don't know how many of you have really looked into cognitive load theory before. Um, it's not as old as some of the theories that are out there, um, older than others, but um, it's been around for a little bit and it really has to do with how we process information uh, when new opportunities are coming to us. It's how we um, think about content coming in, processing in it, making it make sense in our brains, and then moving on to the next thing. So it really is about taking multiple complex tasks um, and piecing it together in our, our heads. Uh, and it's, it's about the amount that happens in a set period of time and whether or not we can handle that. Um, so about multiple things at one time. So about two years ago, um, and really probably about this week, two years ago, um, we all felt like we had run into a wall. Um, a lot was happening in the world. 
elephants were running through the streets in other countries because people were locked inside their houses. Um, we were learning how to use technologies we'd never used before. Uh, we were embracing the chaos of the fact that we didn't even know how we were going to be able to grocery shop or find toilet paper. Um, we were just in a space that not much more could have been on our plate and us be able to process it and we were very aware of it at the time we were aware of it for ourselves we were aware of it for our students and we were really trying to just figure out ways to manage we were without question in the midst of a cognitive load overdue um you know we were overwhelmed too much was happening um, we didn't really think about how that might impact us in the long run at the time. We were just in survival mode. Um, so you don't really want your students to be in a class and be in survival mode in their class. You want things to be at a point that they are optimum, that they are growing and developing. Um, so thinking about the three different kinds of cognitive load, um, there's intrinsic. These are those things that are a struggle regardless. It's a hard concept to get. Um, so calculus uh calculus is probably easy for some people for other people it's not it's not something that just comes to you um and even people that it makes sense to initially there was some delay in how to make sense of it it was a struggle you kind of had to think about your own knowledge your own information your short and your long-term uh memory and how you impact those strategic processes um and while I'm telling you that, and I was mentioning a little bit about the, the pandemic first hitting, so that's hard, even when it's a hard topic just by itself. So imagine if we add a whole bunch of other factors into it, like a pandemic or um, full-time jobs or our tenure track position trying to get tenure or um, those crazy people over in MTSU online telling you that your new course development was due a month ago. Um, but in the midst of that, you also had a book chapter due and you had um, other presentations and you had a tenure review and you serve on a dissertation committee and you're teaching a full load. This is starting to sound a little bit like y'all's life like every day. Um, so when we're thinking about new things and what we're doing and how we're processing those, we also have to think about those outside factors and, and what they're doing with this as well. Uh, extraneous is about how we process that new information um, and how that information is presented to us. So uh, the example I put in here is say you are um, someone who really thrives um, on text and reading and you process that information from reading. Like if you read something, it gets in your brain and it is there and it is there forever. Um, but every resource in your class or every method of communication in your class is um, auditory. Um, it's only lecture. Uh, there is no book. It's just lecture. Um, if you're somebody who really doesn't process information unless you physically see it, an auditory only kind of situation is going to be a struggle for you. Um, and that's kind of a, a side note to think about. Um, how are we conveying that information to our students and how is that information being conveyed to us? What we may be best at may not be what most of our students are best at. Um, and that starts dancing into universal design for learning principles and things like that. Um, and making sure that we are meeting our students and each other in a space where they know how to communicate that information and retrieve that information. So are we actually getting to them in ways that impact their ability to learn best. So thinking about how information is being presented, um, because if it's not being presented in a way that makes sense to you, you have to work harder to make it make sense um, and to make that cognition happen. And then uh, Jermaine is the process we use to solve new problems. So that's just how our own brain creates those paths and makes that information happen and connect um, within our own being, how we've done things previously, how we have to take how we've done things previously and change that process so that we have a better understanding of something new. Uh, so anytime new things are presented to us, we have to think about all of these things. So we're already cognitively overloaded just thinking about how we're going to think about it. Uh, so really 
being intentional about that things can make a difference for you and your classes and how you feel overwhelmed in your classes, um, but also makes a really big difference for your student. So some of the causes of cognitive overload um, are distractions. Um, so cell phones, uh, social media, um, the wrong type of music for you. Um, and I say that because, so big side note, my father was a music theory and composition faculty member. So we always had music in my life. Um, and when we were growing up, we kind of learned the ones that make the most sense to me and how I think I cannot actually listen to classical music and focus on learning because I start listening to the music. I, however, can listen to grunge. You could put out some sound garden and some Foo Fighters and stuff like that. And I can knock out whatever it is that I'm working on and totally tune it out. But I can't do that with classical. So when I say distractions, it's about picking the thing that you can handle that outside influence, but it may not be the same thing that works for somebody else. Um, poorly designed content. Typically, when you read things like this, it calls out instructional designers. So I'm just going to say, we do not make these mistakes. We are perfect. Um, yeah, we make these mistakes too <laughs> all the time. Um, but it, think about a, a bad infographic or like if you use an image that doesn't actually uh, depict the text. So if you have an image, but what you're talking about is something totally different, your brain kind of has a hard time making that connection and you start to overthink or you're looking too much at how to make those things connect and you're missing what's actually being said. Um, and then the knowledge void. So if anybody has ever talked to me for any length of time about just about anything, I bring up the knowledge void quite a bit. So the knowledge void is another place where we really run into um, cognitive overload. So we're gonna talk about the knowledge void a little bit. So there's two types of knowledge void. There's the, um, we don't know what we don't know. I mean, legit, you don't know that you don't know something. So not until someone points it out or they tell you, uh, do you even know? That literally just happened in the hallway. Um, someone, a new process happened at the university. I know y'all are shocked that something new happened. Um, a new process happened um, and the person hadn't previously worked on this thing before. So they weren't on the list of of people that were informed when the new thing happened. So they didn't know, so they got it wrong, but they didn't know they didn't know until they were told that they did it wrong. Um, so thinking about that, making sure that that information, you don't know that you don't know until it's too late. Uh, and then the one that really hits us the most um, in higher education, and when I say us, I mean us as faculty members, um, it hits us a lot that we forget what it was like to not know. Um, we have done this for a really long time. Um, and I don't mean like we're all old enough that we've been faculty for a really long time. I mean, we've been learning for a really long time. Um, we, and we, we have done it at the highest levels possible within our fields. Um, so we are assuming a little bit about students' prior knowledge. There are things um, that we forget once upon a time we didn't know either. Um, you know, I kind of referenced uh, UDL a minute ago, and I briefly gave y'all like a, a one second understanding of what is universal design of learning. I know that you may not know what universal des design of learning is. That is an entirely separate conversation that we can have at some point. Um, but if I had just randomly said, you know, like UDL and then gone on to the next thing and not said UDL is universal design or learning and it's about how we get that information. I was assuming that you all knew what UDL was um, and it would have created a little bit of uh, that cognitive load void for you um, because you'd have been like, what is UDL? I don't know what UDL is. Do I need to know what UDL is? It could have even kind of created some anxiety for you. So it's about making sure that we're adding that extra little bit of information. It's better to tell them again than it is to assume they know and them not know and create failure. Um, and that's the same with us too. Um, so the other, another option of that is we've been doing so long that we forgot. Um, and by that, I mean, like, we have been um, reading academic journals for a long time. 
Um, we are good at it. Um, we don't remember when we were an undergrad um, and we read our first one and probably had a come apart because we were like, I don't know what these words are. Why does it have all these symbols in it? What does all this stuff mean? I don't know what any of this is. And we were very overwhelmed and it took us 50 forevers. Thanks, Tara. 50 forevers to figure out how to get through that first article. And it was a short academic article. It was only like eight pages and we were still like, oh my gosh. But we in higher education and those of us that are you know, in faculty positions and, and work with students every day and teach every day, we read a lot of academic articles. We have figured out how to read those and, and focus on the parts that matter and kind of skip past the parts that aren't as important um, so that we can read through those. A student doesn't know how to do that. So we don't remember what it was like before we knew how to read them. Um, and then pra practice makes perfect. Um, and that kind of leads, it's the same kind of example with that academic journal. It may take me 10 minutes to read an article. It's just a good rule of thumb that it's going to take an, an average reader at least three times as long as it does somebody who's used to reading that. Um, so it's just a pretty good rule of thumb with that. So if you are thinking about, oh, well, it takes me 10 minutes to do this, mm, probably take somebody else 30. Um, what may take you five or 10 minutes uh, in your area of expertise would take somebody else quite a bit longer. I can throw together clearly with spelling issues, um, a presentation and not a whole lot of time using H5P because I know how to use H5P. It's not the content that's the issue, it's the how to use H5P. So if you've been doing it for any length of time, it just gets easier for you and it goes faster. So are you thinking about how long something might take for somebody who's a non-expert? So that's the knowledge void. Be aware of the knowledge void. Remember that we all have one. Um, the students don't know to ask because they don't know they don't know. And it's our responsibility to remember what it was like to not know and remind them of things. Um, one of the examples that I recently used was the and, or, and not in um, when you're doing a library search and, or not. I don't actually remember when it was I learned about and, or, and not. Um, it's not, it wasn't when I was in school. Um, I got my doctorate 11 years ago, um, so the internet then was still being invented. Um, and so we, we really, we had internet searches, but they weren't good. Um, you know, when I was coming up through school, we still used the card catalog to find resources. Um, so and, or, and not were not options you put into a search engine because there wasn't a search engine. Um, so really kind of stepping back on some of those things and thinking about that. Okay, so our 18 year old, traditional college students, they probably know what and or and not is because they were taught. What about our returning college students that didn't learn that when they were in high school or in their early years of college? Um, or I am certain that everyone paid all the attention in the world to library day in uh, their university 1010 class. Uh, Karen, by the way, has a background in library science. So Karen knows. And if anybody ever has questions, Karen and the awesome Jewel Library are here for you to help because they're amazing. But you know, when you were in your University 1010 class and you were doing that library overview, you probably didn't fully pay attention to everything they said because we have a tendency as people to only pay attention to things that we think we need to know in that moment. And we're not thinking as a first semester 18 year old freshman about the research paper we're going to need to write our senior year of college. So taking one minute to stick a YouTube video in an online class that talks about and or not could actually end up saving you and your students hours of work down the road. Um, and it's a two minute video that tells them how to use it um, or linking it to one of the resources provided by the Jewel Library. Um, would do the same thing. So just kind of as part of that load thing, understanding that if you give them that little bit of information up front, 
it may take you a minute or two to put it in there, but it could save you a tremendous amount of time down the road answering questions, redirecting students, um, you know, really providing that extra level of connection that had that thing been in there, it actually saves you time down the road. Um, so really kind of thinking about what those things are. Okay, instruction hours and load estimators. So this is usually one of the things that comes in when we start talking about cognitive load and cognitive overload and where do we get these? Um, I seriously can't spell. H5P needs a spell check or I need to figure out how to turn it on. Um, so instruction hours and load estimators. And also I promise that I will fix this before I share it. Um, so 135 hours for a three credit hour class. Um, that comes from our provost website. Um, so here you go. Uh, it comes from our provost web website where it talks about um, how we get our credit hour procedures. Uh, and it, it imp it's a, about the 15, it's 15 hours um, per credit hour times three. So, um, well, it's 15 hours per credit hour. So if it's a, or 45, because it's one in and two out. So it's 45 per credit hour. So a one hour class is 45, a two hour class is 90, a three hour class is 135. There are some variations based on things like um, uh, art classes, studio classes, um, uh, video production classes, things like that. There's gonna be some, some different um, information and stuff out there based on some of those things. So independent studies are different, internships are different, but the general rule of thumb for a traditional course, a three hour credit course is 135 hours of instruction. Um, and I say instruction and I'm pretty intentional on that instruction because not long ago, and when I say not long ago, I mean like four or five years ago, um, maybe not even that long, um, it was contact hours um, in online instruction. Now, contact is still the case in face-to-face, -face, though there's been a whole lot more awareness of that in the last two years because we just had to appreciate the fact that stuff changed. Um, but contact, contact hours were those that, that 45 hours, that in-class seat time in front of the instructor, you and me having a conversation face-to-face -face kind of time is contact. And Back a couple years ago, so like a thousand years ago, back a couple years ago, it was still measured in terms of contact in online. SACS and other accreditation bodies got it together and figured out that maybe contact wasn't the best use of that term. And let's just talk about it in terms of instruction. So it's 135 hours of instruction in online courses. It's technically 135 hours of instruction in face-to-face -face classes, but we still tend to look at face-to-face -face classes in terms of the 35 and 90, um, the one hour in, the two hours out of work per uh, credit hour of the class for 15 weeks. So, um, so contact back in the day, and this is why discussion's on there with a big exclamation point, the easiest way to get your contact hours and online was through discussions. It was the go-to, it was it, it was the you didn't have to justify it. It was discussions and then recorded lectures. Those were the ways that we got contact hours in online classes. Now, because instruction is measured in a different way and we are much more aware of that community of inquiry and, man, that's a hard word, um, and how we are creating that environment and engagement with our students, it, it's, the, it's the total instruction. It doesn't have to all be this much in actual contact and this much in instruction, it's 135 total. Um, and I keep saying 135 because I want y'all to keep hearing it's 135 and I want y'all to start thinking about what does that really look like? So in terms of that discussion and contact versus instruction, discussion is still a great, great way for us to create a peer to peer environment, which we know is huge, especially in terms of um, meeting students where they are, students perspective, DEI, um, really getting that global awareness and cultural awareness that comes from students interacting with each other. Um, 
we can only provide so much perspective as individuals in the class. So you have me, but then you have 20 other people that have a slightly different perspective and take. So having that discussion in your class is hugely important in terms of cultural awareness and uh, global awareness and DEI and really meeting our students where they are and embracing who they are as different individuals. Intentionality of those discussions is huge on that. Um, closed ended discussion questions. Um, if we ask a question that basically they can just give you the definition from the required resource, um, that's not an engaging question. So some of that content time that people were talking about is, oh, if you write a post that's this long and then you respond to this many people in posts that are this long, then that gets me to my hours. So maybe instead of thinking about it in terms of a post and then respond to two people, it's how we go about creating those discussions and what those discussions look like and having them be active and engaging that the students can take their own personal experiences or their own connection to the resources and really take it to the next level because that creates a different level of discussion and it's not as hard. Um, being aware that within discussions, it doesn't have to be read this, write this. It could be post a video, go out and find your own resource uh, and post it here. And then people go in and engage with each other's resources um, and information and then communicate that way. So we're not saying do away with discussion. We think that they are vitally important in online education because it really does create that peer to peer opportunity. What I'm asking you is, is it necessary to have one every single week? In terms of your cognitive load and your students cognitive load? Why are we doing it every week? Is that because best practices three years ago told us that we should? Um, or is it because we don't know another way to get to that level of instruction? Um, what, what is it that's telling us that we have to do it every single week? Um, now, um, you need more than an introductory discussion. That does, you need that. You, that needs to count as one of the discussions in your class. Please let them introduce themselves to each other. But you don't necessarily need to have a discussion every single week because that's sometimes where it becomes busy worky um for the students and they tend to be like oh another discussion um and you can see and hear what they're saying as they're doing it just you don't got to raise your hand you don't have to acknowledge it um but any of you ever had that moment when you went to grade a discussion that you went oh another discussion if you are having that sensation so are your students um so really think about how we're using those, uh, maybe not every week, maybe every other week, um, maybe really diversify how those are created um, so that we're still getting that peer-to-peer, -peer, but we don't have to do it in terms of, in order for me to get these 15 or 18 hours of contact, I have to have a discussion every week. It's just not measured the same anymore. So yes, have the discussions because we need the peer, but don't feel like you have to have them every week. And that's going to help you with your own cognitive load of A, creating them and B, grading them, but it also helps your students. They're more engaged in ones that they don't have to do every time. Um, so kind of think about how you might do that. Uh, does anybody have any, I haven't paused yet, but does anybody have any questions at this point before we talk a little bit, I'll show you the workload estimators that help you understand the 135? Um, if I may do it by voice, because I would add to the conversation that uh -huh. uh, you're talking about distraction, chat rooms and, and offside chats are very distracting and I turn them off in my presentations because I don't want them distracted. It's like passing notes in a regular class or looking at their cell phone. But sidebar on that. Uh, what about the what about the non-science? I mean, discussions are a non-science. Discussions are an activity that get non-science engagement with work. With science and math, your engagement with the material is more of to be old school, a workbook kind of thing. 
but that's not, I don't want to be old school. What's the new school way of getting students to practice until they're good at adding or to practice until they're good at differentiating? Um, and how do you keep track of that? And you can fold that in somewhere else if now is not right. Um, so, well, in terms of, of practicing stuff, it, that really does also depend on the subject area. Uh, math, a lot of repetition. Um, other areas, it may be more about um, the application, but why can the discussions in math not be about the application of the math? Well, my discussions in math are about process, how to know when to use which process, understanding the features of the process. I do do discussion, but I also require these other things. And so what I'm asking is, what do you do to measure and evaluate and oh, include that, yeah. other kinds of activities? That's the next one. That's what the workload estimators will tell you. Cool. Yeah. Um, any other questions about the 135 or discussions before I show you the workload or is that why y'all are here? <laughs> I, if you don't mind, I'll just add one more thing, um, how times have changed. Um, the general rule of thumb when I was an undergrad was for every credit hour meeting in class, every hour of class time, the expectation was four hours of out of class time. Yeah. That's, that's how time have changed, but the content level hasn't, the okay. content expectation hasn't. So that's why I'm asking about practice because they do have to practice more than the minimum or they're just not going to succeed two weeks later. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Kim, this actually also goes to Jim's question that he posted in the chat about, you know, just curious if overload is more common among younger generations um, because they flit from one thing to another rather than concentrating on one thing. Um, does the overload le is less uh, than going from different types of work? Um, if you have repetition, have you read anything or seen anything on that? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, there's a little bit of information about how um, it's actually over generations. It's caused more and more problems with it. Um, like my generation was that we could we could focus in 14 minutes because of commercials on TV. Um, and now it's more like a minute and 30 um because that's about how long they stay on um a, any kind of image or um a youtube video or whatever they'll binge binge watch for th three straight days an entire entity of a show but if you actually were to ask them about the show you probably would run into some conversations of i don't remember that because at the same time that they were binge watching an entire series of a show they were also doing stuff on their phone and they were um doing doing other things um they weren't just watching it so um that is actually part of that actually dances around um i am a i'm a pretty big advocate for accelerated courses um, which may seem strange when i talked about cognitive load and the time that we need to when we get something, we need time to process it before the next thing. So the time thing is a little bit different um, if you're thinking about an accelerated course, because when you're doing an accelerated course, you're taking one course at a time. Like the people who do the winter one that we have, that's that December, January, or people who do the May semester one that we have, um, it's three weeks. And that seems super intense. And it is intense because it's that same 135 hours that they got to get done in three weeks instead of 14. Um, so it, it's really intense, but they're only doing the one. And when you are trying to learn that new information in, in a history class, and at the same time, you're trying to learn uh, brand new information in a math class, and you're trying to learn brand new information in your um, RIM class, and you're trying to learn brand new information in your research and statistics class, like my brain hurts and I've taken classes and all of those things. So that's where if you're trying to learn too many things at one time, that's when your brain is like, ha, ha, ha. nope. Um, if you're really concentrating on one, you can really intently focus on just that one 
thing and your brain can focus on that one concept. And while it may still be a little overwhelming because it may be a lot to take in and learn and you're doing it in a faster time, you're not doing it in addition to these 14 other things that are happening in your head. You're doing this one area of focus. Um, so, and you'll hear me say stuff like that a lot. And it also goes to the, um, I tend to in classes that I develop and teach, my um, major project for the class does not come at the very end of the class. Um, it actually comes a couple weeks in, a couple weeks earlier, um, because everybody's comes at the end of the class. Um, and so students are freaked out and overwhelmed uh, and trying to figure out how to make all these big things happen. And their brains are tired. And then um, part of it too is uh, at the end of the semester, when we have our final projects due and grades due uh, and exams and all those things over the span of like 48 to 72 hours, we have to get all of that stuff done. We actually just overloaded ourselves too. So kind of, if it works for your class, back it out just a little bit. So, and I'm not saying I don't put things at the end. Mine tend to be like, that's where my peer evaluations come in, that they evaluate each other's work. Um, it's where the presentation of the big project happens at the end. Um, but it kind of gives that, it breaks it out a little bit more so they're not all trying to do it mm -hmm. in the very end. So I don't know if that actually answered your question or not, Jim, but um, that is for me anyway, um, that is where I say, yeah, you have to be very aware that it's very easy to be distracted in our courses um, and in our life because there's just so much going on around us. And if we're trying to think about too many things at one time, we tend to shut down. And the thing that's the least fun is the thing we focus on the least. That's just human nature, though. So I hope that helped answer that a little bit. Um, so workload estimators. So there's a couple out there. Um, and and. I will actually make sure that this presentation gets sent to all of you. Um, the first one is at Rice, um, Rice University with their Center uh, for Teaching Excellence. Um, and this is what it looks like. So I hope y'all can kind of see it. Um, but it's a course load estimator. Um, and it, it shows you reading. It shows you writing. It shows you exams. It shows you other course info. So just as an example, we are typically a 14 week semester. Um, and I can, I'll show you what one of these looks like, but here's the part that I really want you to focus on when y'all start looking at these estimators. So pages per week, if you are in a 1000 level class, um, you will be doing about this much reading in a 2000 level. We go about to hear three, four graduate on um, and it keeps going up and it keeps going up and we have to kind of be aware of that um, when we're thinking about the level of our class so um, how many of you think to yourselves you don't have to raise your hand unless you want to um, how many of you the last class that you took was a freshman or sophomore level class probably not many of us and if we did take one it was probably to audit so we didn't have to do homework um, so most of us, the last class we took was a graduate class. So remember back on that knowledge void, you remember back on remembering what it was like to not know. Um, the last class we took was a graduate class. It probably was an excessive amount of reading um, and exhaustion. Um, and so we were reading very dense, very dense writings. And we were reading a lot of them, um, depending on your area of focus. It may have been more or less, but it really, you were reading a lot. If you're thinking about a one or 2000 level class or even a three or 4,000 level class in comparison to your master's or doctorate level class, there should be a different reading expectation, a different level of work expectation. We cannot expect somebody who hasn't been through what we've been through to be able to do that same level of work. So let's say that they are reading a um, hundred pages per week. Um, our page density. Uh, so this is like thinking about your textbook or your articles or what they're looking at. So a, an academic article, it is tiny font and it is in three columns on a page and they're 110 million 
words on that page. So if we're reading a hundred pages and it's 750 words per page, it is some new concepts. We know some of these concepts, but it's some, and the purpose is to engage. That is seven pages per hour. So think about that. When you're thinking about your students and how much they're reading, it is seven pages per hour and they're reading a hundred pages per week. Uh, Mary, how, how much is that? How many, how many hours is that? It's a lot. That's a whole lot. Yeah. But on so, the other, on the other hand, in math, we basically do three pages a week. So sure. you really have to dig and you have to spend three or four times as much. Yep. You have to actually rewrite the examples to understand them. Oh, yeah, so yeah. it's a different paradigm. Yeah, but that's what the writings and other things. And there's another one I'll show you in a second. It has even more intense stuff. So let's say it's 100 pages. It's 450 words. So much easier to read. And then we're doing it for sur survey purposes instead of engagement purposes. That just shot up to 47 pages per hour. So the reason I'm showing you all this is when you're like, well, reading 200 pages a week is not really a big deal. Um, it could be. Uh, and it probably actually is um, because that right there, if they're reading 100 pages a week, that right there is two hours out of class. So you're at two of your three hours of instruction for that week right there in your 100 pages of reading. Um, and that is for not too dense of a page, some new concepts and only for the purpose of survey. So kind of thinking about those things. So that's what the course load estimator can kind of help you do. It does the same thing for writing. It does the same thing for exams and other assessments. Um, but I'm actually going to show y'all the one from Wake Forest. It looks a lot like it. Just so you know, it looks a lot. They're all basically the same. So this one also adds in things like discussion posts. It adds in videos and podcasts. Um, it adds in type of writing assignment. And this is the one from Wake Forest. And I'll send you this one too. But y'all can Google if you just type in Wake Forest course load estimator, it'll show up. Um, it gives you a little bit more in terms of your options, what you're looking at, um, types of assignments, whether or not the class meets in person, um, number of discussions, type of discussion. Um, and I thought this was nice on this one, it's text and audio video. So if you're asking them to do a video note, what kind of time does that count as? Uh, so that's what this one, it, it's just a more involved one. Um, and Mary, I think one like this one might work better for you too, because of the type, you can look at different assignment information. It allows you to put more uh, diversity in your activity type in it. And there are others out there as well. These are just a couple of the ones that um, are the most common in the field. So, um, but when y'all have time, so like May or June, um, look at one of your current classes and actually go through and do a workload estimator on it so that you can see what it looks like in terms of your students completing the course. Um, and I, and then I think, kind of think about uh, it for Kim, you. Yeah, I think um, what you're saying is very helpful because I can um, equate different kinds of assignments. They might not be labeled the same way, but they mm -hmm. I could they could say a writing assignment, and I could equate that with some other kind of assignment. Absolutely. Because I know in grad school we used to joke because in a in a graduate level class in math you'll spend three days on a paragraph. Yeah, it's it's just a different style of notation and writing and comprehension expectation, and that's what matters when you're doing your estimating. I can't so even imagine my own cognitive overload of spending three days on one math problem. I feel like I would shut down. Like <laughs> so you build up to question. it, you don't do it raw. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, Tammy. Um, so I love the estimators. My issue, and maybe this is what Mary was alluding to as well, I have trouble estimating, especially in my digital strategies class, how long it will take to complete a project because mm -hmm. we have students with very, it's just one class that has the novices as well as the experts in it. So I may have students that, you know, have no social media experience, no experience with using any type of platforms. And then I have some that are very proficient. 
So, and then it's not really writing, it's learning a new platform. It's how to develop an email newsletter or how to you know, create an infographic. So how do you estimate those types of creative projects? So yeah, um, that's where it, it kind of comes into, um, I also ask students about how much time and start to kind of get a, a background of that. Um, Tara, do you have any suggestions since you work with um, REM faculty the most? I'm just totally put you on the spot, sorry. That's okay. <clears throat> hey, everybody. Um, my first thought is to create a variety of assessment so that for, for one assessment, so that students who have more experience could choose something outside of their purview and instruct them to do so. So that even though you're not necessarily able to estimate the same thing, you know you're at least approaching it with each project, knowing that they are learning something. It's not just repetition of what they've done, maybe in their job. Um, that would be, that's my first thought. I would have to think a little longer. I'm going to be <laughs> honest, but that well, was my initial thought is let, let's talk about some authentic assessments that would address each student. And I think, and I could be wrong, Tammy, but I do think you and I also talked about doing like a short survey at the beginning to find out which students yes. were where they were at. So we could address that as well in that way. Yes. Um, and so that those would be, that would be my first suggestion. Let's figure out ways that we can get topics now that you know that information from your students that are, are going to be new for those students. Yeah, and Tara and I are getting ready to address that when we redesign the um, digital strategies course, but I just wanted to kind of get some input as I'm thinking through how to revamp some of the projects because I do, um, Kim, to your point, I asked them how long it takes on average for them to complete the assignments. But I get everything from three hours <laughs> a week to 15. And I'm not kidding. Yeah, no, I believe that. Cause, well, and some of that is just making choices about what you use. So um, for example, an infographic, when, when you're first learning how to create an infographic, that takes a lifetime because mm -hmm. you are trying to figure out how to take information and, and process that information to create your outline, to ultimately create your infographic, which that's sometimes a step students forget. They just start putting stuff in instead of actually structuring an outline first. Um, and maybe that's part of it is have that conversation. Uh, but then if you have never used any of those services before and you get in there and you start playing with those templates and then you start playing with those add-ons and you start playing with all the extra bells and whistles that you can put on it that that is a, a time vacuum mm -hmm. you end up in there and you are like oh that was 12 hours ago I started looking at this I should get up um, but it's just because you get so fascinated by it but they're really getting fascinated by the pretty colors and the things that it can do and really kind of having some of those conversations with people about it's going to seem like it's going to take a long time if you've never done this before but here's a few tips to prevent you from getting lost in this hole mm -hmm. um a pick one and go with it doesn't matter which one you pick but pick one and go with it don't spend five hours in canva don't mm -hmm. uh, and then five mm -hmm. hours yes. in vengage and then five hours in pick to chart pick mm -hmm. one and go with it if you decide for the next project that you want to try a different one great but it's about the learning experience of how to do it. Um, and, and so for me, the way that I look at things like that, and like when you look at it in terms of an estimator, it's, it's one of those ones that it's not, there's no draft. There's no, um, you're not thinking about it in terms of like, it's not reflective. It is truly engaged learning. So you could still use things like the writing assignment one, but it's going to be up here on research. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of um, suggestions I might add. Um, I break when they're really doing a big chunk of engagement learning, I break it into smaller pieces and give them a suggested time frame and tell them if it's taking you more than two hours, you need to check with me because something's not working right. Um, and in small chunks, I can estimate what a newbie person is going to need to do for that small chunk um, for routine testing purposes. I use a multiplier. If it takes me 15 minutes to make out the answer key, it's an hour test. Um, that's just what's done over the years. Um, and then the, the third thing is um, they 
that you need to get them checking back to you with you frequently because they bog down a third of the way in because they do get this cognitive overload avoidance reaction. And so if you have them checking back with you, that pushes them forward and keeps them from getting as bogged down. But that's a couple of things I use. Thank you for that. Uh, I think just any concepts of scaffold scaffolding and chunking is helpful because mm -hmm. if you can give it to them in smaller pieces, it helps them feel success as they go and they're more likely to go and it won't be taking as long in the future. But the first time somebody does something, it's always going to be overwhelming. So just kind of preparing for what that looks like. And, and that goes back to, uh, you know, maybe the first time that they're doing something that they're making an infograph or they're making a short video, that it be a, a low stakes, no stakes activity. Um, so they can play around and not feel so anxious about grades either, um, which is just a whole nother entity. Um, before, like we only have a couple minutes left. And I want to give you all a couple minutes to ask questions um, after this. There is a really good podcast. So you can totally just Google that. Um, but there is a podcast. It's the Teaching in Higher Ed podcast, episode 375. And one of the people that is the names listed at the top of the Wake Forest course load estimator. She is the one that does this podcast. So if you're looking into um, getting a little bit more information about how those work, it might not be a bad podcast to listen to, um, but don't listen to it while you're also grading other things and watching TV and making dinner and caring for family members. Cause that would cause overload. Um, so the very last thing, um, and I know it's pretty quick. And so we probably need to do another one of these that we go into a little bit more detail. Um, but the resources and the, the top tips for, uh, in, uh, from us, from MTSU online is to be intentional about what you're putting into your course. Um, be very aware of the information, um, think about its purpose and why it's there. Um, we have a couple of resources that we can share with you and, and we're happy to share with any of you. Um, and we'll make sure that those go into the information that the LT and IT sends out afterwards too. Um, but our key questions worksheet actually takes you from your course learning objectives all the way down to specific module outcomes. Um, and you have to ask questions of yourself and then justify why you do some of the things you do in your class uh, or why you might. So what that really looks at is, are we doing that thing in our class that we're like, the textbook has this many chapters and we have to teach them all. Do we, do they need to learn everything in that textbook in this one class? Um, do we need to get to a point that, that they're ready to talk about application of information first? memorization of information. Um, and some of that depends on the class. It depends on the topic. It depends on a lot of other things. Um, we also have roadmaps that are in there um, that help you actually structure your class. Um, and then thinking about your types of assessments. We've talked about that a couple of times and diversifying your type of assessment. Maybe we don't need to have a, a 30 page research paper for a freshman level class. Maybe they need to be learning how to use and or and not their freshman level class instead of a 30 page paper. Um, so really thinking about that. Um, and then the one final point is if you add, you must remove in higher, higher education, that's everywhere, but we do it everywhere. But in online education, it is so easy to be like, oh my gosh, I found this awesome video. I'm going to stick it in this class. Or I found this new podcast. I'm going to stick it in this class. It's exactly what we're talking about. It's exactly what we're covering. I'm going to stick it in there. Great. What did you take out? Because for every single thing that you add in, you have increased your instruction hours. You have increased your student's load. You have increased your own load. Uh, you have increased what it is that people are having to do in terms of learning and you teaching. Uh, so for everything you put in, something else has to come out. So that's where it goes back to that being intentional too um, and thinking about, activities like that. And I think in terms of that type of assessments and being intentional and your own time and adding things as well, really thinking about are the topics that you're covering, are the concepts that you're covering, what is the best way to assess those? Um, in, you know, 10 years ago in online learning, um, it really was just a digital format of a correspondence class. Read this, write this, 
take this test? Is that actually the best way for us to be thinking about the concepts in all of our classes? What are the best ways for them to be doing um, all of the different resources and information? So kind of just thinking about those things. If you want any of these resources, we're happy to send them to you. Um, so what questions does anybody have? I'm gonna stop my screen share and push back on that. But what questions does anybody have? And I know it is right at the time. So we'll stay for a while. Don't worry, we always do. Um, but what questions could, does anybody have? Yeah. If I could throw one quick question in. In my mind, when I look at what I'm teaching, gen ed, introductory survey, and graduate level courses are alike in that you don't have a common expectation of content coverage. If I teach a gen ed course and I get one and I substitute something out, it's not going to kill this student. But if I'm in fresh, late freshman, sophomore, junior in my major, and those credits are transferring all over the United States and I'm building a linear skill set to the next course and the next course and the next course, I don't have any, uh, I don't have any ability to adjust the content. I have to cover what is nationally expected of coverage in that material. So that if they transfer to UTK or University of Indiana, they have got the coverage that says they've got. So it, do you see any difference in how to yeah, do that? It's not, it's not the content coverage, it's more the resource. So no, like the, in, in your, math, no, in math no. it's the content. Coverage. I understand what, what I'm saying is it doesn't necessarily mean the content. It may be the resource. So if you find, like if you're covering a concept um, in your class because it's required in order for them to go on to the next one, great, mm -hmm. need to cover that. If you find a new video out there that really conveys that information in an awesome way, and you want to put that video in there, you don't need two videos that do the same thing. Oh, you no, don't I need a video that. and a podcast and an article that all do the same thing um, yeah. as required. So that's what we're saying when we're saying if you add, take something out, don't yeah, overdo. Yeah, I was going back a couple of things earlier. I was going back on discussions or um, um, I, I'm, I'm having a bad time explaining it. So yeah. maybe you and I can talk about this another okay. time. But it's, it's um, I don't have the option to say, do you understand limits at infinity? They must understand limits at infinity. So I can't get creative about ways I test that because I can't add more time in that doesn't, they can't spend more time on limits at infinity when I'm maxed out on time. It's like you're saying, you gotta take other stuff out. So how do I make sure that they stay engaged on task and do all these tasks and find ways to assess those that are skill driven rather than, because some person will take 10 minutes, another person will take half an hour to learn the same thing. And they both have to come out at the same place at the end. So how do I, how do I play with that? Sorry, I took too long. <laughs> It's okay. Um, I, I think I understand what you're saying. So one of the things to be kind of aware of in terms of measuring workload and, and load estimators and things like that, this is just an average. So you really are going to have some students that sail through it in 10 minutes and others that sail through it in an hour and a half. Um, and there's only so much you can do with that, but you need to find the space in the middle that you are, don't assume everybody's going to do it in 10 minutes and don't assume everybody's going to do it in an hour and a half. Pick that space in the middle. You are always going to have somebody that gets through it faster and you're always going to have that somebody who gets through it slower. Um, and that is okay. Um, because also in the next concept, it may be reversed. It may be completely flipped around the other direction. Um, so looking at it in terms of across the board, where are most going to be? Um, and, and know that. And that's kind of also where that key questions come in is um, if you're looking at that key questions worksheet and you've gone through and you're like, these are the things they have to know at the end of this class. Uh, what assumptions did we make at the beginning that they already know? Um, are there things they should have known from the class previous? Um, are, are we believing that they actually did learn those things because they passed that class and they're now on this one? Um, 
Are you spending time reviewing those things that is actual time in your class um, that maybe you shouldn't be that's causing things to be rushed further on? So are we duplicating efforts in this one that should have been covered in the last one? And instead of us really duplicating efforts, do we put a couple of resources in there? Like, as I was talking about the and or not, instead of spending a whole bunch of time and an entire module in a class teaching students about that, do we put a two minute video in there that is in there that says, hey, if you need a little refresher on how to do this, here's this video um, that we put that in there, but that's not actually expected as part of our course. It's there for a resource if they want it, if they need it. Um, and sort of really, and sometimes that actually involves conversations where a whole department gets together and we do legitimate curriculum mapping. We're happy to help with that if y'all would like, that we do actual curriculum mapping across each of your courses to see who is teaching what and when, and are those things actually getting conveyed that students need to know. We find out sometimes when we're talking to a faculty member that they think all of these things have to go into this one class, but as it turns out, three of those things are taught in this other class over here, and one of these other things is taught in this class over here, so we went from having 15 things that needed to be covered in this class, and we're down to 10. Um, and all it took was just looking to see where some of those other things were covered. I recently developed a class that it in it, it said that the history of the, the concept needed to be taught in this class. And I was very confused because shouldn't history have been covered in the introduction class? Um, so when I started asking questions, yes, in fact, history is covered in the introductory class and it didn't need to be covered in this class, which opened up a lot more opportunity for me to focus on other concepts and covering those concepts in a, a deeper, more meaningful way instead of a, a broad, overwhelming way of getting all of this stuff in. So sometimes it really does just involve those conversations with others as to where they are and where we need them to be and then kind of providing those extra level of resources if a student needs it. I hope that makes mm -hmm. sense. Okay. What other questions y'all have? And I think I should probably stop the recording in case y'all have, I'll, I'll stop the recording. <laughs>